Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, session on Schopenhauer. And uh, before introducing our two speakers, I'd like to uh, mention some uh, practical matters. So um, we would appreciate if, uh, if you could switch on your uh, videos, uh, unless you have Wi-Fi issues, because we think it's, uh, it makes for a nice uh, atmosphere. And uh, we'll have a Q&A uh, later on. And if you have a question at that point, please uh, use the raise hand uh, icon. Um, it's also possible to uh, put questions in the chat, but um, uh, in fact, we prefer to have the questions um, um, just uh, during the Q&A where, um, where you speak uh, to everyone else. And uh, we'd also like to ask you to keep your questions uh, short and focused. So let me now uh, welcome our uh, speakers. Uh, Alistair Welchman is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And his um, areas of research are wide ranging. He has uh, published on Kant, Maimon, Schopenhauer and Schelling, uh, but also on very different topics, including robots, and border ethics. He's the editor of a forthcoming uh, collection of essays titled Politics of Religion and Religions of Politics that will be published with uh, Springer's, Springer. Sorry. Uh, and Alistair is also very active as a translator. Uh, so he's one of the translators of Maimon's essay on transcendental philosophy. And I, I have it in my uh, office, so maybe I can show it. And this morning I taught um, a class on Maimon by using your very helpful uh, translation. Uh, Alistair is also um, a co-translator together with Judith uh, Norman of uh, Schopenhauer's The World as Will and Representation uh, with Cambridge. And the second volume is uh, uh, forthcoming. Yeah, so that's also very impressive um, work and uh, great service uh, to the academic uh, community. Uh, Alistair's talk will be followed by a response from Swami Medhananda. Uh, Swami Medhananda is an associate professor at Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda University. And his areas of research include Vedantic uh, philosophical traditions, cross-cultural approaches to philosophy of religion and um, uh, consciousness. He is the author of many articles uh, and uh, two books uh, and I'd like to mention uh, the titles. Um, he uh, published a book called The Dialectics of Aesthetic Agency, Re-Evaluating German Aesthetics from Kant to Adorno in 2013 with Bloomsbury. And a more recent book with the Oxford University Press titled Infinite Path to Infinite Reality, Sri Ramakrishna and Cross-Cultural Philosophy of Religion. So uh, welcome to uh, both of you uh, for um, being uh, at this uh, session. Uh, so uh, we'll proceed as follows. Uh, Alistair will uh, give his talk. Uh, Swami will give his response. Alistair will uh, get back uh, with some uh, answers. And after that, we'll have like uh, 30 minutes for uh, Q&A. And after uh, the formal end of the session, we'll uh, leave open the Zoom meeting so that uh, everyone who wants to can uh, hang on and uh, continue the conversation. So the title of Alistair's talk is A Defense of Schopenhauer's Account of Compassion. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen. Um, I'm not going to uh, read anything. Um, I'm just going to use uh, slides and um, and and extemporize. Um, I do have uh, a copy of the slides, um, which I'm going to try and drop in the chat if I can find the chat. Let me see if I've got the link. Uh, my students uh, prefer this as a mechanism uh, to me screen sharing. Yeah, so that's a copy of the same slides that I'm, I'm using. Um, and if you want to follow along in there, it's uh, be a bit like having a, um, 
uh, quote sheet, which it occurred to me that I would like to have, in fact, uh, uh, gotten, but I didn't get around to it. Okay, so um, this is a very limited defense of, of Schopenhauer's theory of, of compassion. Um, there's a, a wide metaphysical version, and that's not the account that I'm going to defend, but I think Schopenhauer has another account, um, and I'm going to defend that more limited version. Uh, it's still somewhat um, uh, metaphysical in nature, as I'm going to uh, talk about really briefly at the end. Okay, so uh, brief overview. Um, I'm just trying to find a place to put that. Yeah, there you go. That's better. Uh, brief overview, um, the standard view of Schopenhauer's uh, theory of compassion is that compassion as a kind of state that you can be in, um, and I'm, I'm not, there are a complicated array of, of, of related concepts to compassion, like empathy and sympathy, and there's a complicated literature uh, that uh, differentiates them in various, often inconsistent ways. Um, Schopenhauer is not aware of that literature and doesn't uh, make a particularly complicated set of distinctions. Um, and so I'm just going to treat uh, compassion as involving uh, some kind of a, a cognitive component, cognitive or perceptual component that involves um, being made aware of uh, someone else's uh, feelings. Uh, for Schopenhauer, that's being made aware of someone else's will. Um, uh, and, and that that must be accompanied in some kind of an appropriate way by an emotional response on, uh, on your part. So it's not going to, I'm not going to say anything more complicated than that. Um, that we're able to do that on the standard view, Schopenhauer thinks, is explained by our numerical metaphysical identity with each other. We're all the same. Um, and if you're capable of achieving some kind of recognition of that fact, we're all fundamentally numerically metaphysically the same. If you can capable of achieving some recognition of that fact, uh, then uh, you are open to um, being aware of uh, the um, emotional states of the other and of course of responding to them. And um, in a uh, uh, throwaway line that I'm not gonna think about anymore, but which is definitely uh, interesting, uh, especially for someone writing in the early part of the 19th century, Schopenhauer explicitly compares this uh, with early Hindu thought uh, and talks about seeing through the veil of Maya. The veil of Maya is the veil of representation. We see through that to our metaphysical identity. So that's the standard view. The, many people have complained about that view. Um, it's a very expensive way of explaining uh, compassion. So there has been a revised view um, for which there is a, a certain amount of evidence in Schopenhauer, but instead compassion is explained um, not by a metaphysical identity, a numerical metaphysical identity, but by a process of psychological identification. Um, the, that's section two, section three. The problem with that view of Schopenhauer is that um, Schopenhauer knew about an early version of uh, a psychological identification view uh, of compassion. Uh, he knew about it uh, because it was presented in the treaties by this guy, Ubaldo Cassina. Uh, he knew about it, he read the treaties, uh, and he explicitly rejected that idea. So there's a tension between the, it, it's nice to attribute the naturalized view, but it's difficult because Schopenhauer rejects it. Um, and what I want to do is break the, to break the dialectical impasse between those two alternatives and reading his account of Casina, his rejection to Casina, I have a, a phenomenological alternative that I'm going to present briefly and defend. Um, then actually the thing that I'm most interested in, but I haven't worked it out, um, is uh, that um, I'm, I wonder if there isn't a, a similar problem uh, behind both the metaphysical and the psychological views, even though they're quite different. Um, and that the similar problem lies in this notion of identification, um, which uh, I've, I've tried to uh, do some research on the notion of identification, um, and it's radically under-theorized in the, in the philosophical tradition, radically under-theorized. Um, and so that's 
uh, not worked out that part of the paper, but I definitely think that's the problem. And I think it's a problem both for the metaphysical and the psychological uh, versions of the theory. Um, and then at the very end, um, I don't want to say that we're not going to do some metaphysics. I like doing some metaphysics. So I think there is a metaphysical element uh, to, to Schopenhauer, to this phenomenological version of Schopenhauer's theory. Okay. So I already, I already talked a little bit about this. With, I'm not going to do too much uh, about the um, actual definitions. Um, the best one uh, that I've come up with, so there's a, a, a complicated dialectic, but I like a, a, a definition by um, uh, Blum, uh, who argues that uh, the best way of con conceiving um, uh, states like compassion uh, is intentionally um, but there's a perceptual component, so I perceive the emotional state of the other, um, and then um, I have an emotional state that is intentional and takes the emotional state of the other as an intentional object. And maybe you need some other conditions uh, to get a, a fully worked definition of compassion. Um, but like I say, Schopenhauer does not engage in uh, any kind of uh, complexity here. Um, so I, I just, I feel the need to make that distinction and then we can leave it, I think. Um, one thing that is uh, significant for this, for this uh, paper and that um, I have encountered problems with is just a contextual problem um, that when um, Anglophone uh, philosophers talk about uh, compassion or sympathy, um, the Anglophone tradition, including the historical Anglophone tradition, emphasizes it uh, as a part of the construction of moral judgment. And that's not true for Schopenhauer. Um, and I think it's not true for the um, other people in the German tradition as well, um, that uh, Schopenhauer sees compassion as um, having explanatory. I mean, I'm just interested in the theory of compassion. Schopenhauer's, Schopenhauer's own interest in the theory of compassion is specifically in terms of moral motivation. So he thinks compassion provides the ground uh, for an otherwise difficult to understand uh, moral motivation. Okay, so the standard view, I'm just going to read a quote. The just person, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about that later, but right now I'm going to say, that's, let's say that's someone who's motivated uh, by compassion, shows in his way of acting that he recognizes his own essence, namely the will to life of singing itself in foreign appearances that are given to him as mere representations, and thus rediscovers himself in those other appearances to a certain extent, namely that of doing no wrong, i.e. failing to cause harm. This is the extent to which he sees through the principle of individuation, the veil of Maya, and to this extent he equates the essence outside of himself with his own, and he does not harm it. So um, I, I want to do as little uh, kind of background Schopenhauer as possible, but I'm, I'm gonna need to say something. Um, he has a broadly Kantian view. Um, there's a, he's a transcendental idealist. Um, so he thinks the world is representation. Is, that's his name for the, um, the phenomenal world, the empirical world in the, in the Kantian view. Um, he's radically uninterested in reason and concepts. Um, but I don't think that's relevant here. I think the crucial thing here um, is that uh, he associates the transcendental conditions uh, of the world as representation. There's a few of them, um, but two of them are space and time, no different from Kant. Um, here's a, an inference that is different from Kant. He says that space and time taken together comprise not just conditions of, of representation, conditions of experience, uh, but also conditions of individuation. And then he makes an inference that's uh, very similar to the inference in uh, um, transcendental aesthetic in Kant, controversial inference criticized by Fendelenburg, um, but Kant makes it, and so does Schopenhauer, um, that if space and time are conditions of uh, representation, uh, then they can't be thought of. The same things can't be thought of as attached to things in themselves. Um, if uh, space and time are in addition to, uh, in Kant's view, uh, for Schopenhauer, if they're also the principles of individuation, 
then it follows that things that they are in themselves can't be individuated. And bang, uh, we've got the view uh, that um, we are all qua uh, things in themselves uh, substantially identified uh, with each other or, or put in a, a slightly more modest way. We can't be differentiated from each other because there's no principle of differentiation uh, to do it. So there are uh, clearly all sorts of problems uh, with that uh, argument, but it's, it's fun and quite easy. Um, there are probably other things that Schopenhauer is thinking, but for now, that's, it's a nice, simple argument. Um, and, uh, and it gives us a rationale uh, for thinking uh, that, um, it gives us a rationale for thinking why Schopenhauer would want to think uh, that we're metaphysically uh, identified with each other, or can't be metaphysically differentiated uh, from each other. And then, of course, the, the second way in which he deviates from Kant, the famous epistemically problematic way, at least Kantians, um, that he thinks he can name the thing in itself with its will, um, which here is going to, I'm only going to be thinking about that in terms of, of affect or emotion. Certainly, I obviously think of it in terms of action as well. Um, and uh, we're just going to accept that. If that's the case, uh, then um, in recognizing somehow, um, perhaps philosophically, uh, that I am um, not, differ not different from you, uh, I am recognizing that that is true at uh, an effective level, that it's our affect, that our, that our feeling, that our willing, that's the same thing. Um, and so that gives extra reason to think that compassion. So that's the standard view. Uh, there are many uh, objections uh, to the standard view. Here are uh, a few of them. Um, uh, this was the first one. Uh, points out that um, if you're interested in compassion um, because it is uh, a possible explanation for the possibility of altruistic action, um, right? So I can, if I recognize my essence as non different from yours, then it's at least in principle possible uh, for. Uh, states of your emotion to your emotional state to be uh, to act in me as reason for um, uh, for helping you. Uh, a, a broad outline of what Schopenhauer wants compassion to do. Uh, but if that's his if that's his claim, uh, then making everyone identical uh, looks like uh, it's it, it's uh, uh, inconsistent with that objective uh, because if we're all identical, it's not, I'm not acting on the basis of, um, of my evaluation of your emotional states, because they're mine as well. Uh, so it's just egoism, uh, once again. And that's an objection that um, even Schopenhauer's friend uh, made to him. Um, and he had uh, some trouble. Uh, he did try and respond to it, but he had some trouble uh, doing it. Uh, second line of objections is uh, a fairly uh, obvious line of objections, uh, especially in the Anglophone world, still somewhat post-positivist, uh, that people don't like the metaphysics. Uh, it's, that's just too, it's a crazy metaphysics. Um, uh, and so let's, let's see what, there's a general tendency in Schopenhauer scholarship, maybe diminishing a little bit now, uh, to naturalize Schopenhauer um, and see what's left over if we get rid of the, uh, of the unorthodox, uh, you know, transcendent metaphysics. Uh, so people just don't like it. Um, a better objection, I think, uh, comes from the phenomenological tradition. Uh, so um, Max Scheler, uh, who I'm unfortunately going to quote quite a lot in this paper, because I think he's actually very good. Um, Max Scheler uh, wrote a, a book on sympathy at the beginning of the 20th century, um, which has a, a, extensively engages with, with Schopenhauer. Um, and he makes a neat but simple objection. He says, it doesn't, doesn't, metaphysical identity doesn't make sense in the explanation of compassion uh, because compassion presupposes the separateness of person. I can only feel uh, compassion for you. I can only ex uh, experience your or, um, 
have some kind of cognitive access to your emotional state and then have some kind of response to that if you're a separate person uh, from me. So it presupposes that, that we're different. And so uh, trying to ground it in um, non-difference and undifferentiatedness is just not going to work. Um, and then uh, there's a fourth objection that I first came across in Nietzsche, in the gay science, um, which I don't have a great name for, so I'm just calling it the, the it's icky objection. Um, the metaphysical identification is icky because it eliminates one uh, personhood. So this is, it's less of a philosophical ob objection, so it's, or it's not operating as a... I don't want to say it's not a philosophical objection, but it's not operating at such a high level. Uh, but I still think it's an important objection. Um, and since then, um, in a, a, a paper that I'm not mentioning it in the notes, but I'm going to tell you now by Bernard uh, Reginster, um, uh, he set me on to reading um, some feminist uh, critics uh, of this idea. Um, so um, I was particularly impressed by a Marilyn Fry paper that uh, described it as, um, described this uh, metaphysical identification, being metaphysically identified with another person as a form of, of metaphysical cannibalism. Uh, so erasure of one's person. So that's, um, well, a simple version of the objection is uh, to point out about the kind of uh, the, the doormat character who's always doing what other people want, kind of similar to critiques of utilitarianism, the kind of doormat character who's always um, sensitive to what other people want and doing what other people want. Uh, if you take that far enough, um, then it erases uh, your own personality, your own uh, selfhood, uh, makes you into a cipher uh, for other people kind of at an empirical level. Um, and that that's icky. There's something definitely wrong with that. Um, and uh, feminist critics, of course, put that in the context of, of patriarchy, uh, where there is a structural tendency uh, for men to uh, demand um, uh, subservience from women that takes the form of uh, subordinating themselves to men's projects. And that is a form of identification, which is icky. Um, is the best word I've got to describe it. So uh, as a result of all, or at least some of those objections, um, the, the secondary commentator on Schopenhauer, um, David Cartwright, uh, who's just written uh, so much about this and um, uh, so compellingly, um, he's, uh, he said, uh, well, we should get rid of the, um, this notion of metaphysical identification and replace it with an imaginative or psychological uh, notion of identification. So notice that he retains the notion of identification. Uh, it's just not metaphysically grounded anymore. It's psychologically grounded. Um, and so uh, this follows a structure something like this, right? I, I perceive your outer non-mentalistically construed behavior or I observe your situation. This should be a familiar kind of argument structure here. Um, I imagine what I would be feeling if I exhibited that behavior. Uh, so I see the smile, um, I rehearse to myself what a smile would be like to me, uh, and then um, uh, realize what kind of feeling that is, and then I project that feeling that I'm now having uh, into you. Um, that right, so I'm, I'm psychologically identifying with you. It's, it's a, um, the way this mechanism is supposed to work uh, looks as if it's pretty similar. Uh, to the notion of projective, what's now called projective empathy, right, where I project myself uh, into your situation. But I also want to emphasize, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this too much, but I just want to mention it, uh, that it also has the structure uh, of um, the argument from analogy in the, um, in the uh, uh, analytical philosophy of mind, right, an argument from, from analogy for the existence of other minds. It has that same structure to it. Um, okay. So, um, the problem with this view, with Cartwright's view, which he admits, um, is that uh, Schopenhauer has been exposed to a view that's quite similar to it uh, from this guy, uh, Casina. Um, and uh, Schopenhauer uh, briefly mentions Casina 
um, doesn't quote him, but paraphrases him uh, and, uh, and rejects it. He rejects the theory. So I'm just going to defend the view that Cassina's theory really is similar to the kind of theory of psychological identification um, that Cartwright uh, wants to attribute uh, to Schopenhauer. Uh, so the first two moments of the psychological identification are, um, I perceive your external behavior, um, and then I imagine what I would be feeling if I exhibited that behavior. And uh, here is a, a little quote from, um, from the Cassina book. Uh, it's, Cassina is Italian, um, and uh, I can't read the Italian, but it was translated into German. And so I, I read some of the German and I'm translating the German here. So I, I can't vouch for how accurate this is ultimately. Um, but uh, Cassina says, uh, when we see someone suffering, and it would be, um, it's obviously not super well phrased, but um, if, uh, if, we, if, we, uh, if we saw anything other than their suffering behavior, then the process would be question begging. So this must be their suffering behavior. When we see someone suffering, a connection habitually arises in us uh, between the sensations of pain, which we've had in the past and which we now recall, and the feeling that the actual pain of another person uh, causes in us. So we see someone in front of us, they're suffering. Um, it's not that we know that or that we directly perceive that. Uh, rather, we see the suffering behavior and then uh, uh, mechanistic, Cassino is a very, it's an empiricist uh, philosopher, really, uh, mechanistic association of ideas, um, kind of philosophy of mind. Um, when we see the external suffering behavior that uh, stimulates in us uh, memories of the kind of thing that we felt when we were undergoing that kind of behavior in a sort of mechanistic way. So that's sort of phase one of the uh, Cassino, uh, which I, I think is pretty similar to the perceived imagined structure uh, of the um, psychological view that uh, Cartwright is attributing to Schopenhauer. And then the third phase of the um, psychological view is projection. I project that feeling uh, into your body. Um, and I, I like this uh, uh, quote very much, um, uh, but I'm just going to, I'm not gonna read the whole thing out. I'm just going to point to uh, the, the uh, highlighted phrases um, we're transposed when we see the suffering of the other. We're transposed by a kind of emotional contagion into a painful state by the imagination. And then in this last sentence, uh, without noticing, we transfer the feeling that we've gotten by emotional contagion to the other person and then identify that uh, that, yeah, we identify that, the feeling that we're having in ourselves with the feeling that the other person uh, is having. So it's a, 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 an early kind of mechanistic version uh, of a projective empathy idea. And I just want to emphasize that notion of transfer, transference uh, and identification. So Schopenhauer knows this theory uh, and rejects this. Uh, and this is what he says. And the rest of my paper is kind of a meditation on this on this quote, so I'm going to read this quote out. Um, as a consequence of the above ex exposition of compassion as a, a being motivated immediately by the suffering of the other, right? So the context of Schopenhauer's theory of compassion is he, he wants to find a, um, a way of explaining um, non-egoistic uh, moral motivation, altruistic motivation. Uh, how is it that the, I know how my um, wheel and woe, Schopenhauer says, I know how my wheel and woe can act as motives for me, but how can the wheel and woe uh, of another person act as motives for me? Um, well, I want that to happen, and compassion is how it happens, but I've got to rebuke the error, frequently repeated uh, later, but made, first of all, he thinks, by Cassina, who holds that compassion comes about through a momentary deception of fantasy. As we substitute ourselves in the place of the sufferer, and this is a pretty accurate rendition, I think of what Cassina says, and then in our imagination, take ourselves to be suffering the other's pain in our person. It's not like that at all, Schopenhauer said, says, rather it remains clear and present to us at every moment that the other is the sufferer, not us, and it's precisely in the other's person and not in ours that we feel the pain to our distress. We suffer with the other, thus in the other, we feel the other's pain 
as the others and don't imagine that it's ours. Well, that kind of rejection of the role of uh, psychological processes and especially imagination and fantasy, that rejection seems pretty clear. Um, seems pretty clear that Schopenhauer is not going to accept a, um, uh, uh, a psychological uh, uh, account of compassion. Um, and I'm, I'm just highlighting the, the I'm gonna, I'm, I actually I'm highlighting a couple of things here. Um, this notion of substitution, uh, right, which is, um, that's the moment at which uh, something like identification is happening because we're substituting or we're confused uh, on Cassina's count about uh, who is who. Uh, and that's happening in the, now in the imagination, but it does look very similar to the kind of stuff that was happening in, uh, um, in med the metaphysical identification theory. Uh, I also want to notice that it's uh, where um, we're motivated directly, immediately, he says, uh, Schopenhauer by the suffering of the other. It's not mediated. It looks like it's not mediated by psychological processes. And then the last quote, we suffer with the other, we feel the other's pain, don't imagine the ours. So there's a clear uh, separation of persons uh, that Schopenhauer is attentive to. So uh, both Cartwright and Schopenhauer present an exclusive dis disjunction between the psychological and the, the metaphysical uh, theories. Um, Schopenhauer, so there's, there's no question, uh, Schopenhauer um, rejects the Cassina theory and he's clearly and at no point says anything other than that the metaphysical theory is the correct one. Um, Cartwright takes the same uh, disjunction, regards it as, as having the same exclusive structure, um, and simply says, well, the metaphysical theory is so bad uh, that we're just forced to adopt the psychological theory, even though Schopenhauer says it's one thing where, where he, he appears to reject it. We're, we're forced to, to, um, to accept the psychological theory. Um, and uh, I just want to say that there is uh, an alternative um, which I think is uh, accessible. Uh, it's a phenomenological alternative, and I mean that in several ways, uh, that Schopenhauer himself regards compassion uh, as uh, having a kind of phenomenological role uh, within his uh, philosophy. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, I also think it's phenomenological just in the, in the uh, banal sense uh, that Schopenhauer, uh, when he's forced to think about what the structure of compassion uh, how it must be experienced, uh, he's quite clear about things that he's not so clear about at other times, like the separation of persons. Uh, that's just clear to him on a phenomenological level when he does the analysis. He doesn't always do it, but when he does, it's clear. Um, and then a third sense in which it's phenomenological is that um, I think the phenomenological tradition uh, provides resources for, for understanding and defending this third alternative um, in the um, set of explanations. Um, so, uh, just at the level of, of uh, a brute text, um, the, uh, the proposal that, the implicit proposal that Schopenhauer makes when he's giving his rationale for rejecting Cassina, uh, that seems to be um, a rejection of it, Implicit in it seems to be the possibility of a rejection, both of the, the psychological and the metaphysical views. Uh, so he seems clear that we perceive the pain of the other. We have cognitive access of some kind uh, to the pain of the other. That's direct. It's not mediated by psychological processes. Of course, when he's talking metaphysically, so Schopenhauer says, yeah, of course, we can't explain compassion psychologically. That's because you can only explain it metaphysically. When he's talking like that, He's happy to just reject uh, psychological processes. Uh, so uh, he, but he seems to say I'm in direct cognitive contact uh, with the, um, the emotional states of the other. Um, and that direct form of perception counts out a psychological process that constructs it. It counts that out as being constitutive. That can't be constitutive about cognitive access. Um, and then when he says that uh, I directly perceive your pain, both as pain, I is an emotional state and as yours, uh, then um, it's, I'm directly perceiving it 
uh, in a distinctively second personal way, right? It's not just, I don't just have access to my mental states and then behavior. There's a, a second person, an I thou and an I thou relationship. Um, and the direct perception is clearly inconsistent with the psychological disjunct. Um, and um, experiencing the pain, experiencing something as pain and, and yours is clearly inconsistent with the metaphysical disjunct in which the only way in which I have cognitive access to your mental states is by being you, recognizing that I am you. Uh, this is clearly inconsistent with that. So it looks like he's got there the outlines uh, of a view. Um, he's got the outlines of a view that uh, is neither psychological nor um, metaphysical. Um, and I also want to say it's rejecting the common premise of both those views, which is that compassion is based on some form of identification. Uh, Cartwright sees this, um, but he just says, uh, that's, a, that's a weird, Schopenhauer's description is weird. It's extraordinary, he says. Um, there's no evidence or argument for the existence of this experience that Schopenhauer thinks that it's possible uh, to have. Um, and in, a, in a, a, an amusing paper that, that Cartwright wrote uh, somewhat more recently, uh, he says, it's the, that explanation of compassion is the same as uh, Schopenhauer's metaphysical explanation for clairvoyance. So Schopenhauer believes in a whole bunch of weird things, including clairvoyance. Um, and it's the same argument uh, Cartwright points out. Uh, and so that's not, we're not going to be particularly convinced by that. Uh, but I don't think that's right. Um, I'm going to give three uh, brief uh, reasons uh, for thinking uh, that that's not right. Um, that Schopenhauer's phenomenological theory isn't extraordinary. Uh, one is that uh, direct perception, the, right, that cognitive perceptual component of it is plausible. There's a long-standing dialect, at least there's a long-standing dialectic on this issue, and I think it's phenomenologically uh, plausible. Um, uh, second uh, rationale uh, is that I think Schopenhauer is right in regarding uh, second personal either relations as um, irreducible. You can't reduce them to first person and third person uh, relations, and that's um, another um, insight that I think comes from the phenomenological uh, tradition. And I have a less strong reason, which is that the the role that compassion played in Schopenhauer's overall works uh, kind of changed over time. All right, so I'm going to say something uh, kind of brief about, e about each of these. This is going over, this is going over right now, it's going over work I've done in other places, so I, I don't want to spend too long on it. Um, I, I do think it's weird and interesting, though, uh, that this dialectic between Schopenhauer and Cassina, um, right, between a um, uh, psychological uh, theory uh, of, um, uh, of access to the mental states of others. So right now I'm focused just on access. Of course, there's a, uh, an effective component to uh, compassion, but they, they're, um, the effective component doesn't make sense without the perceptual component. And Schopenhauer himself argues in other places that he knows those things are separate. So we can just talk about the perceptual component. Uh, if we just think about the perceptual component, um, then the Schopenhauer Cassina interaction is very similar to an interaction um, in the early part of the 20th century um, between um, Litz and Scheler. And Litz is the guy that coined the German term Einfühlung, uh, which is a uh, nonce word, it's a, a made up word, um, uh, and has then been translated into the English tradition using the word empathy, which is also a, a made up word or a, a, new, I say, a new coinage. Um, and uh, Lips produced a uh, theory of psychological identification very similar to what we now think of as projective empathy. Um, and Shaler uh, rejected that uh, on the grounds that it is an inadequate account of our perception of um, the emotional state of the other. Um, and that debate is still ongoing uh, between um, uh, uh, the um, simulationist school uh, and the mirror neuron school in contemporary neurological attempts to base um, theories of empathy in neurological accounts, uh, and people like Dan Zahavi and uh, Sean Gallagher, uh, who are explicitly influenced by the phenomenological tradition. Uh, what's the critique uh, there? 
well um at base i think the idea is uh that um empathy is supposed to be performing the role of a um of an account of perception right if we can't have cognitive access some kind of access to the emotional sense of the other then it doesn't make sense to say that we're reacting to them uh, so we can't really have any notion of compassion um but um um, the, the Lipsian view and the projective empathy view is essentially an indirect theory of the perception of the emotion of the other, right? So I don't actually make cognitive contact. I don't make perceptual contact with the emotions of the other. I only make contact with my own emotions, right? Which I generate by projecting myself into the other situation or in the slightly uh, sloppier uh, casino account, which I gain by emotional contagion but through a very similar process, like we're, we're, we're elaborating the causal process there, but not interested in the insufficiency of that causal process. Um, if, that's, if, if that's how it's working, if it's supposed to be grounding and uh, uh, make, making cognitive contact with the emotions, then it's not working. It's not doing its job uh, because I only end up having access uh, to my emotions. Um, and it, I, a nice quote from Shayla, uh, uh, at the top here, where I just just to make plausible the idea that um, we're we're not really going to be able to ground any theory of compassion if we don't make actual cognitive contact, actual perceptual contact uh, with the emotions of the other, and that means you know that attending to uh, what's the the way that those experiences do phenomenologically appear to us, which is that uh, you know barring special circumstances. Uh, we see the shame in someone's blush, right? That's, we are in just making perceptual contact with the shame uh, through the medium of the blush. Uh, and of course, that direct perception theory, I'm, I'm not going to make any more argument for it, except to say it's not as crazy uh, as Cartwright uh, makes out. Um, and I have recently published a paper uh, arguing that Schopenhauer is independently um, has independent interest in direct theories, of, in independently favored direct theories of perception. And that would make this, um, that he has a direct theory of emotional perception, uh, more plausible. Um, the second argument, which is related, but I think goes kind of philosophically deeper, is this idea, um, I'm just gonna read this, this uh, Shela quote, it's about projective empathy. Projective empathy can only serve uh, to confirm that it's myself which is present all over again, and never that this self is other and different from my own. And I think that's a somewhat difficult quote to unpack, and so I'm just going to spend like a minute trying to unpack that. Um, I think Shayla's idea here is that um, um, argument from analogy, ways of making contact with the mind of the other, and um, any uh, attempts to expand the notion of analogy using more complicated psychological mechanisms, they all suffer from the same problem, that I have access to first and third personal data, I have access to my own um, emotional states, I have access to the third personally construed non-mentalistic behavior of the other, and that if you combine those two things, you'll never get exactly what Schopenhauer says is a part of the phenomenon of compassion, my understanding that the pain is pain, i.e. a mental state, but not my pain. It's your pain. That can't be constructed from first person and third person resources. If the argument succeeded, all I would have ended up showing is that the other has my mind, because that's what first personal data gives me access to, my mind. In other words, it would have violated uh, the separateness of person. So I think that's a super interesting argument. I'm not going to say anything uh, more about it now. And I think Schopenhauer is, is um, he's a little bit of a loose thinker sometimes, but I think when he thought about compassion, he had awareness that that was a, a, a crucial part of it. Um, I, 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 this is too complicated. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm um, obviously much too aware of the text of Schopenhauer, having, as Karen pointed out, translated thousands of pages of it. Uh, so I'm just going to say um, Schopenhauer seems to have, he, he does not talk about compassion as much as you think. 
uh, for someone right who's, uh, who's for whom compassion seems to be so central. He talks about it much less, um, and he talks about it in this one book where he wasn't allowed to talk about his metaphysics because it was an anonymous prize essay, and he thought if he talked about his characteristic metaphysics of the will, people would immediately ID him, uh, and he would, his anonymity would be broken. So he had to rethink things, um, and compassion starts to play a central role at the moment when he does not have access to the metaphysical stuff, at least just in terms of argument, argumentative structure. When he doesn't have access to that, compassion is the, what he calls the, the everyday experience, the everyday phenomenon that explains uh, the, the comp uh, how, how we could possibly take uh, the feelings of others uh, seriously as they could be a motive for our action. Um, so it seems like compassion has this phenomenological role to play in his philosophy. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, so, uh, like minimally, the minimal kind of form of argumentation here is just that uh, I want to say it's not um, the rejection. There is a third view between the psychological and the metaphysical, and um, I don't think I've made like a knockdown case for it. It's gone too quickly. Uh, but at least it's not a crazy view. It's at least a reasonably serious view. Um, and now I just want to uh, just say briefly, um, so this is the thing that I'm, I'm just, I'm currently thinking about, that it does seem like both of the views uh, that Schopenhauer is tacitly rejecting when he criticizes the scene, both the metaphysical and the psychological views, are, are views about identification, that what we have to do uh, in order to um, experience compassion is to identify with the other person. And I think that's just wrong. Uh, you don't have to identify with the other person because identifying with the other person erases the barrier between you. And there's a, a decent, um, I think, Scheler's, Max Scheler's argument uh, against, uh, against the metaphysical Schopenhauer view is great. Uh, the compassion does presuppose separateness of person. So have that experience involves a distinctively second personal view that precludes the possibility uh, of identification to the, to the extent that we're identifying, to the extent that we're kind of being smeared over each other, uh, that's an extent to which we can't be experiencing uh, compassion. Uh, but I also think that uh, there's not just philosophical reasons. So I've been impressed by the, um, the Marilyn Fry's kind of feminist critique. Uh, and I just want to give you another uh, uh, version uh, of a similar critique that directly affects psychological theories of identification. This is a book by, from a book by Sadia Hartman, uh, and it's a quote uh, from an abolitionist, um, a, a white abolitionist, so abolitionist of slavery in the, in the US, in the antebellum, before the Civil War uh, time. Um, and he was, so he was a radical uh, abolitionist, uh, in many ways a, a brave guy, uh, who wrote uh, tracts against slavery. And this is a quote from one of those tracts uh, in which uh, he engages in this explicitly in this process of psychological process of projective empathy. Uh, so he's viewing uh, a slave train, a coffle, it's called, of enslaved people. Um, and in order uh, to present in the maximally efficacious way the anti-abolitionist case, uh, he engages in this process of identification with the enslaved people, which Hartman points out is a, a complete erasure of the actual people concerned. They've gone in this picture, and now it's him and his wife and his children. Now, in some circumstances, right, that form of projective identification through projective empathy it doesn't seem so bad. But in this circumstance, uh, it comes close to a complete misunderstanding uh, of the role of the other there. So it's, it's that, and it seems like what's doing the harm there is this notion of identification. So just like metaphysical identification is harmful, a kind of metaphysical erasure of one's personhood is a harm. Um, it seems like the psychological uh, attempt uh, at so the understanding of empathy as a psychological projection uh, of oneself onto the other uh, precisely erases the other. One doesn't have access to the to the emotional states of the other, only to one's own states, 
And that's philosophically problematic because it erases the second person at the philosophical level, but it's empirically problematic because it erases empirical others at that level. Okay, and um, uh, last slide, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna say anything about this because it's deep in the, in the secondary literature, but I, just, I do just want to say, uh, there is a metaphysical element uh, to Schopenhauer's account. I, I, I am uh, a defender of Schopenhauer's metaphysics, not in this case, but in general, I'm a defender of Schopenhauer's metaphysics. But I think he's wrong about this simple argument uh, that um, space and time are the principle of individuation. And so uh, outside of, uh, of representation, outside of individuation, we're non, we're non different uh, from each other. I just don't think that uh, that argument holds water. Um, and uh, he kind of admits that uh, because uh, he differentiates ethics from, from holiness or asceticism uh, in, his, in the world's will and representation. Um, the ascetic uh, achieves kind of full identity uh, or recognizes their full identity with others. The um, compassionate person, however, recognizes less of a distinction between themselves and the others. Um, and it's possible to reinterpret that not as a continuum, but as a binary, where in, um, in ethical action, in compassion, uh, we are actually, in fact, respecting the boundary between persons, uh, but that that boundary might go down to a metaphysical level. Um, and that's also plausible. There's a famous contradiction in, in Schopenhauer uh, between the identitarian metaphysics of um, the world's of representation and his rehabilitation of Kant's notion of intelligible character character in the, um, in the uh, compassion book, in the prize essay, uh, where intelligible character is clearly both um, not at the level of representation, so it's at the level of thing in itself, and at the same time individuated. I have an intelligible character and you have an intelligible character. So it's quite possible for there to be a metaphysical basis uh, for uh, Schopenhauer's views. Uh, it's just not the metaphysical basis uh, that he thinks it is. Okay, I'm sorry if I went a little over time there. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Alistair. Maybe you'll, uh, you'd like to, to stop the screen sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, and so uh, I now turn over to Swami for his response. Thank you, Karen. Um, I wrote out a response, so I'll just read it. I hope it's not too boring. I'm grateful for the opportunity to respond to Alistair's thought-provoking paper. He argues that Schopenhauer's critique of Ubaldo Cassina's theory of compassion in his essay on the basis of morality, here after BM, gestures toward a plausible theory of compassion that resonates with contemporary empirical accounts of compassion and that is grounded in a genuine recognition of the other's suffering as the others. Alistair contrasts this phenomenological account of compassion both with Schopenhauer's own account of compassion in The World as Will and Representation, hereafter WWR, which is grounded in the metaphysical identity of everyone as will, and with theories of compassion based on psychological or imaginative identification defended by Cassina and more recently by David Cartwright. To my mind, Alistair's most original and provocative suggestion in this paper is that Schopenhauer's critique of Cassina's theory of compassion applies equally to Schopenhauer's own metaphysically grounded theory of compassion in WWR, which Alistair claims is based on the quote, conflation of persons and a failure to honor the I-thou relation. But this is also precisely where I find a haziness, if not an ambivalence in Alistair's argument. On the one hand, he sometimes suggests that his aim is primarily an exegetical one. After all, he calls his paper a, quote, defense of Schopenhauer's theory of compassion, which leads us to assume that he is providing a new interpretation of Schopenhauer's own understanding of compassion. Accordingly, Alistair rejects what he calls the standard interpretation of Schopenhauer's theory of compassion in WWR as grounded in the metaphysical identity of persons as will. And he claims that Schopenhauer offers a more plausible phenomenological account of compassion in his later work, BM, Basis of Morality. As Alistair puts it, Schopenhauer's view in Basis of Morality, in contrast to the WWR view, positively emphasizes the distinctness of persons, end quote. 
But if Alistair's aim is primarily an exegetical one, then I think his argument has some serious problems. Most seriously, he does not provide convincing textual grounds for rejecting the standard interpretation of Schopenhauer's theory of compassion as grounded in his metaphysics of will. Instead, Alistair identifies a number of philosophical problems with the standard account of compassion, uh, which I don't have time to rehearse here, but he did a nice job in this presentation. What Alistair doesn't show is that Schopenhauer recognized these philosophical problems or that Schopenhauer moved away from the standard view in his later work. Indeed, Alistair himself admits that Schopenhauer continued to ground his theory of compassion explicitly in the metaphysics of will in the final chapter of BM. And I would add in chapter 47 of volume two of WWR published four years after BM. Accordingly, in a footnote to section 67 of WWR one, volume one, Schopenhauer notes that his brief account of compassion in the first volume, quote, has received a more detailed and complete description in my essay on the basis of morality and in chapter 47 of volume two. So that's a quote from Schopenhauer's volume one of WWR. It is clear then that Schopenhauer himself thought that his detailed phenomenological account of compassion in basis of morality is perfectly compatible with his metaphysically grounded account of compassion in WWR volumes one and two. From an exegetical standpoint, then, I think it's clear that Schopenhauer upheld the standard metaphysically grounded view of compassion up until the end of his life. Hence, I think the title of Alistair's paper is misleading since he is not defending Schopenhauer's theory, a theory of compassion, which remains metaphysically grounded to the end, so much as defending Schopenhauer's phenomenological account of compassion in BM while rejecting Schopenhauer's own grounding of his phenomenological account of compassion in his metaphysics of will. On the other hand, at several places in his paper, Alistair suggests that what he is after is not exegesis, but something more like constructive philosophical engagement with Schopenhauer. Accordingly, he writes on page eight of the paper that uh, I assume he shared with you guys, quote, is it not possible to accept Schopenhauer's critique of Katsina psychologism and avoid postulating a metaphysical identity? I think it is, end quote. In particular, Alistair argues that Schopenhauer's, that quote, Schopenhauer's phenomenological rejection of Cassina's imaginative or fantastic, i.e. fantasy-based deception that confuses identities is equally a rejection of an actual metaphysical identity of the kind that was supposed to underlie compassion in WWR, end quote. This is an intriguing suggestion and one which I will examine further below. But it's clear from such statements that Alistair is in effect turning Schopenhauer against Schopenhauer, or to put it another way, presenting an internal critique of Schopenhauer's views on compassion. According to Alistair, Schopenhauer's critique of Cassina undermines his own metaphysically grounded theory of compassion. But if this is what Alistair is doing, then it's, I think it's misleading for him to claim that he is offering a quote, defense of Schopenhauer's theory of compassion even if, as he qualifies his title in the paper's first sentence, it is only a limited defense. So I would encourage Alistair to clarify his intentions in his paper. And if what he is doing is salvaging the promising phenomenological core of Schopenhauer's theory of compassion, minus the metaphysical baggage with which Schopenhauer saddled it, then I think he should say so and repudiate his exegetical ambitions to explain Schopenhauer's own views on compassion. I want to conclude my response by critically examining Alistair's central thesis that Schopenhauer's critique of Cassina's theory of compassion in the basis of morality also undermines Schopenhauer's own metaphysical grounding of compassion in BM and WWR. It is telling that Alistair omits the final two sentences of the paragraph from BM containing Schopenhauer's critique of Cassina. These final two sentences are as follows, quote, but the explanation of the possibility of this highly important phenomenon of compassion is not so easy, nor to be attained by the purely psychological route as Cassina attempted to do. It can turn out only metaphysically. And I will attempt to give such an explanation in the final chapter, end quote. In other words, Schopenhauer himself insisted that the only way to understand how we can feel another person's suffering as her suffering is by rejecting that is by recognizing that at a deeper metaphysical level, we are one with that person as will. As Schopenhauer puts it in the final chapter of BM, the quote, metaphysical basis of ethics consists in one individual's immediately recognizing himself 
his own true essence in the other, end quote. From this perspective, I think we can defend Schopenhauer against Alistair's criticism. The key to understanding Schopenhauer's position is his metaphysical distinction between appearance and reality, which he discusses in the final chapter of BM. As Schopenhauer notes in the final chapter of BM, quote, plurality and difference belong solely to mere appearance, end quote. And my feeling of compassion for another person in her suffering is an expression within the realm of appearance of the metaphysical truth that I'm actually identical to that person as will. Schopenhauer reproaches Cassina for mistakenly thinking that we imaginatively feel another person's suffering as our own suffering. By contrast, Schopenhauer claims that the right way to understand the phenomenology of compassion is as follows, quote, this is from BM. We suffer with him and thus in him. We feel his pain as his and do not imagine that it is ours, end quote. Contrary to Alistair, I think this account of compassion can only be understood from the standpoint of Schopenhauer's metaphysical distinction between appearance and reality. When we feel compassion for another person, we know that we are different from that person at the level of appearance, and hence that the suffering belongs to that person rather than to us. But our feeling of compassion expresses the deeper metaphysical truth that we are identical with that person as will. Alistair claims that Schopenhauer's metaphysical grounding of compassion amounts to a problematic conflation of persons. However, I think Alistair's criticism of Schopenhauer is based on the mistake of confusing the ontological levels of appearance and reality. For Schopenhauer, compassion is an ethical phenomenon that is only possible within the realm of appearance. Since I can only feel compassion for someone else so long as I recognize the difference between myself and that person. At the same time, my compassion for that person is a phenomenal expression of the metaphysical truth that I'm one with that person as will. To use an analogy, let us say that we have some clay and we make a clay elephant and a clay giraffe out of this clay. Obviously, the elephant and the giraffe are different clay formations. At the same time, it is also obvious that both the elephant and the giraffe are one as clay. Similarly, Schopenhauer holds that in the feeling of compassion, we recognize our difference from the sufferer at the level of appearance, and that this feeling of compassion is a phenomenal expression of our identity not as persons, but as the one metaphysical will. For Schopenhauer then, we are identical as the one metaphysical will, but we are not identical as empirical persons. Hence, I don't think Alistair is correct in claiming that Schopenhauer's metaphysical grounding of compassion entails a conflation of persons, since the persons remain distinct within the realm of appearance, which is precisely the realm in which compassion is possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there is um, a lot to respond to, Alistair. I don't know if you want to give it a try. Sure, yes, uh, Swami, thank you very much. Uh, that's a, a, a very thoughtful and, um, um, and uh, nicely Schopenhauerianly grounded uh, response uh, uh, to what I'm saying. On the first point, I should just basically say, you know, guilty as charged. Uh, it's, it's a, it is a reconstructive uh, project. Um, and uh, really, in my defense, I can just say that there's something awkward about doing the history of philosophy in general. You don't just want it to be textual. Uh, but on the other hand, you sort of want to learn from the text. Um, uh, and that involves you know, a, a kind of complex engagement between uh, exegesis and attribution and evaluation. Uh, but yeah, my title is definitely totally misleading. It's a defense of the Schopenhauer that I wanted Schopenhauer to be. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> um, uh, I would say that there are, uh, so on the easier question of just the kind of a textual, at the textual exegesis uh, level, um, you know, it's what you say is definitely true. Uh, Schopenhauer never repudiates. Uh, the metaphysical theory, um, but he's also uh, one of those philosophers, right? He's not like, like Wittgenstein or whatever. He's not one of those philosophers uh, who engage, who has a kind of crisis of conscience and changes their mind about everything. Uh, 
Um, he, he's like, no, I'm still saying exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing. Um, and so there is a sense in which his self-presentation um, is one that uh, minimizes uh, the change in his philosophical views over time. And so one can't always say, uh, just because Schopenhauer continued to maintain this view explicitly, uh, you know, which he did in the, the, the end of the, um, at the end of the basis of morality. Um, I think the chapter was added later, um, but at the end of basis of morality, he's like, yeah, metaphysics is the only thing uh, that can explain uh, this phenomenon. Uh, psychology can't do it because it's just inappropriate. The only place we could go is metaphysics. Um, and it's also true that he released the um, second and third edition of the world of representation after um, he had um, published the, the prize essay, so after he'd done this account of compassion from criticizing Athena, and didn't change the metaphysical view. Um, uh, nevertheless, I think there is, uh, there is some tension in his writings about that, uh, and especially, I think, um, on this question, so now I'm kind of addressing your second, uh, your second point, uh, which I think is a super one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really like the idea, uh, you know, that compassion is a, um, a mixed level uh, phenomenon, uh, that it's the expression of uh, metaphysical uh, identity, uh, but perceived at a level where metaphysical identity, it can't be perceived. Uh, so it's like the extrusion of metaphysical identity into uh, um, uh, uh, into a realm of representation where uh, where identity is preserved, and so it's at once um, only to be understood on the basis uh, of the identity, um, but also preserves the um, the uh, respects the difference between person because it's a feeling that's had at that level. So one might distinguish it then from. Um, uh, from aesthetic experience uh, in Schopenhauer, right, where he uh, where he says pretty clearly um, that uh, you uh, you become um, you stop being an individuated subject uh, when you're having aesthetic experience. Um, so it's it, it it pulls you out of uh, the, the 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 web of identity, um, and you could say compassion doesn't do that. It doesn't pull you out of the web of identity. Uh, it, it just intrudes um, metaphysical identity. It's the perception of metaphysical identity for people that are unable to perceive metaphysical identity as such. Yeah, filtered through this lens. Yeah, I, I do think that's uh, uh, kind of a, a, a nice idea. Um, and it appeals uh, both to the phenomenological and uh, uh, metaphysical. But I, I do also think that there are changes in Schopenhauer uh, that suggests that he was uncomfortable with that, and it's the, the two things that I that I that I mentioned. Um, I think are relevant there, um, and perhaps the most important one, though, is this this uh, his commit his continued commitment uh, to the notion of intelligible character, uh, right? Which is just looks like it's blank. It's it's meta it's at the metaphysical level, and it's just inconsistent uh, with the idea that the metaphysical level is is populated by only one thing. By an undifferentiated, by a thing which we can't differentiate, right? Intelligible character, right? I have one, you have one. It's clearly individuated. Um, and uh, I didn't, I didn't talk about it in the paper, but for a long time, um, the 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 consensus in the Schopenhauer community was uh, just uh, we don't like the metaphysics. So the fact that the metaphysics has contradictions in it. It's just all the more reason to ignore that and just focus on the empirical level. Um, that's that, that's I don't that, I don't favor that kind of move. Uh, but recently, uh, people have pointed out uh, that uh, he 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 uh, he also um, defends the idea of differentiated units at the metaphysical level uh, in the aesthetics, because when you aesthetically contemplate something, what you do is you uh, you end up becoming a non-differentiated subject, but contemplating um, the platonic idea of the uh, empirical object that you're, um, that you're empirically uh, 
uh, perceptually connected to. Um, and that, of course, presupposes um, uh, individuation, right? non-spatiotemporal individuation uh, at the level of the will. But if you've got that, then maybe you have it uh, in, uh, it, maybe that's a defense of intelligible character. Um, and uh, some people have been making that argument uh, recently. So that would, so the, that's my defense of why I am, that's my defense of why I am defending Schopenhauer's metaphysics, because I think there's a way of introducing uh, individuation into the, um, into the metaphysics. But okay. at the same time, I think your, your view is really an attractive one as well. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure that this discussion uh, could continue, but I think at this point it would be nice to open up uh, the discussion and uh, invite other uh, participants to ask questions. Yes, either to Alistair or to Swami or just um, more general points. So um, uh, please uh, raise your hand either by using the icon, but uh, since we are a small group, you can also just raise your hands um, physically. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, Farhad, please. Hi, Alistair. Nice to meet you. Yeah, so uh, I was wondering if you're making this uh, comparison between uh, Schopenhauerian notion of compassion and that of empathy in Husserl when you maybe are defending this phenomenological alternative and attributing this to Schopenhauer. So uh, I think the question of you know identification is still resist even in Husserl and there are so many uh, opposing readings of how empathy in Husserl should be read. So uh, I don't think in this sense, it, it might be helpful at all to, to just adopt this uh, alternative view and, you know, attribute compassion to a phenomenological account of empathy. So we know that one can say the same thing about Husserl Heidegger, uh, that uh, your account of otherness is still uh, the reduction of the other to the to the one, and we know that, for example, Levinas has done such a very severe critique to the Heideggerian Husserlian uh, phenomenology. So, uh, does it help at all to you know to, to attribute a, a phenomenological account of empathy in um, interpreting compassion in Schopenhauer? And a related other question is, what is the status of compassion in? Schopenhauer, because in phenomenology, in, in Husserl Heidegger, we, we see that empathy or intersubjectivity, so to speak, is still uh, has this epistemological status. So they are trying to ground objectivity itself on this common ground, common world, uh, intersubjective uh, reading. So uh, I doubt whether it's the same with Schopenhauer here. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Farah. It's nice to it's nice to see you. Um, uh, yeah, so the, I think the problem um, the problem with uh, with empathy is uh, that there's a um, in the phenomenological tradition there is a um, there's an there's an ambivalence. The term is just or ambiguity. The term is just used in two ways. Um, so on one view, uh, empathy is um, uh, you know, is this is a psychological process. So, especially if you're an empiricist uh, or if you're a cognitive scientist or whatnot, uh, then you're interested in kind of implementation mechanisms. And you're thinking about it in those in those terms. Um, now, uh, sometimes uh, phenomenological objection, contemporary, so Dan Zahavi and Sean Gallagher, for instance, sometimes they uh, oppose that as a theory of empathy. So they treat empathy as the overall concept, and they say, well, you could have uh, a psychological, a simulationist psychological or mirror neuron theory uh, of empathy, uh, you know, or you could have a phenomenological, right, uh, direct perception view of empathy, right? Uh, so that's the way the contemporary debate is often structured. Uh, but the, the uh, early 20th century debate treated and, and I think this is 
probably more correct, treated empathy as it's only a psychological, right? The claim that empathy is the way we make contact with other people's uh, feelings is the claim that we only have an indirect perceptual access to them. It's a psychological theory. And if we reject a psychological theory, we reject empathy. And so you see that structure of I'm not the uh, Husserl eludes me a bit, uh, but you see that in Max Scheler. Um, and you also see that in Heidegger uh, in his uh, critique. There's a critique, he has a critique of empathy in um, uh, chapter four of Division One of, of Being in Time. Um, and that the critique of empathy there is it's all psychological theory. So, right, I mean, I think there's just so much terminological confusion in this, uh, in this arena. But uh, I was using the more old fashioned uh, terminology, uh, which I actually think is clearer uh, that empathy just means the psychological theory. And it's, it's a version of the argument from analogy and commits you to an indirect theory of emotional perception. And direct theories reject that. Oh, and joint attention. Yeah, you were talking about joint attention. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I don't think uh, it would be it'd be fun actually to think about whether one could do that with with Schopenhauer. Um, mm. But uh, it, it would definitely. It's. I, I just don't think. Um, I don't think it's there. You know, it's 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 there in some of the other early German idealists, right? In uh, Fichte, maybe. Um, but uh, that idea of of uh, uh, you know definitely present in the in the phenomenologist that um, that you know our recognition of the other is is at the same time a, a recognition that we inhabit a shared world. So yeah, that, so, that shared that shared the, world is constructed that way. Intelligible character is also a very Kantian notion, isn't it? So I think we cannot find this in all the phenomenological tradition. All right, all the contemporary. Oh. Uh, discussion yeah. around the subject, so they lack this intelligible character that Schopenhauer refers to. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. Yeah, that's the. Uh, um, but uh, I, I am I'm I'm independently. Um, I, I have I'm independently I independently approve of Schopenhauer's metaphysics. <laughs> So I actually think not not all of it, not some of the aspects of, of uh, non-individuation, but the idea that the intrinsic property of everything is will, um, I would def I defend that. Uh, and so I'm, but for independent reasons, for theoretical reasons. And so I'm interested in in maintaining uh, some form of, of textual consistency. Um, and so I, I'm interested in the possibility that you know when we when we, um, you know, when we introspect, we make contact with our intrinsic uh, property, and that's will. Um, and uh, correlatively, on the view of compassion that I'm trying to develop, we would we would literally make contact, cognitive contact, with the intrinsic property of the of the other in doing that. And that would be the intelligible character. Yes. So, but it's not connected with a really. It's not connected with a theory of compassion. I just think the metaphysics might be right. And so if I'm going to interpret the compassion theory, I should interpret it in relation to the metaphysics. It's not the, it's not the individual, it's not the non-individuation part of the metaphysics. Right. Yes, it's, yes, it's, the, it's the idea that we have um, non-relational intrinsic property. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for the questions, uh, George, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I just uh, wanted, wanted to ask, uh, can, can we think of a, a Schopenhauer's uh, pre predecessor in such a theory of, uh, of compassion, or, or would you like to argue that it is like his, his total innovation? Oh, you know, George, I just don't know. I mean, um, there's clearly, uh, um, uh, I mean, there's clearly Casino is clearly operating uh, in a um, in an existing uh, tradition, uh, but um, I uh, I already feel like I'm I'm reaching into the like weird unknown bowels of the history of philosophy by reading the Casino book. I have trouble justifying spending the time it took me to read the, the book, um, and he's one of those 18th century figures whose textual practice is never to quote. 
any contemporary, any living figure, uh, but to refer to them, presupposing that you'll know, and I don't. <laughs> so, so I know he's in a in a uh, some kind of a uh, there's some kind of an early modern uh, pre-Kantian uh, tradition, um, and I just don't know exactly who it is that that Cassina is in in dialogue with. Historically, compassion has been um, looked looked down on, right? There's a kind of uh, the Chian history of philosophy in which compassion is characteristically kind of modern um, uh, it, it's a it's not a noble sentiment um, and so it's kind of characteristic of modernity uh, to emphasize it but you know Nietzsche I wonder if Nietzsche read literally any other philosopher than Schopenhauer sometimes so I don't think he's necessarily got a great historical sense if anyone knows, you know, I'd be happy to find out if there's other stuff going on in the in the 18th century. I mean, there's definitely, I mean, there's a, uh, you know, there's Adam Smith and Hume, of course, writing about uh, about sympathy, um, but it is from a, a somewhat different perspective, right? From this perspective of of trying to give an account of the an empirical account of the origins of moral judgment um, rather than um, motivation. And they're all essentially um, uh, projective emphasis theories. They're, that's the, the psychological theory, obviously, because they're empirical. Okay. So maybe I can ask a question myself, Alistair. Uh, so um, the term metaphysics has been used a lot. Uh, it has been defended, it has been detected, uh, and so on. Uh, but to me, it's not very clear what exactly is meant by metaphysics in this context. Yes, it seems like kind of, kind of very broad term um, that is used as a label. But um, to me, it's not so clear what metaphysics means in the context of uh, Schopenhauer. Yes, because he's supposed to be, um, well, um, a post-Kantian uh, in a sense, or a Kantian. And which means that he cannot simply accept uh, a classical notion of metaphysics. Uh, so, in, of course, he introduces this notion of the will. Um, but to what extent can we simply, you know, call it um, uh, a metaphysics? Uh, and, and, and to what extent has it a different kind of status than, um, let's say, like Nietzschean or Wolfian um, metaphysical theories? Yeah, no, no, that's that's great. I, I know obviously uh, some of your work, Karen, on um, on Kant's metaphysics and your exploration of the ambiguity of that of that term. And I actually think that that's true for Schopenhauer as well. Um, that in his early work, uh, uh, you know, he adopted um, um, a Kantian posture on the notion of metaphysics. That um, that metaphysical claims were um, broadly identical with uh, synthetic a priori claims. So that's, those are, that's metaphysics. That's the only metaphysics we can have is synthetic a priori uh, claims, conditions of possibility uh, for experience. Um, and then he changed his mind. And so that's before the whole will thing. So early on, he did not think that the will was that thing in itself uh, very early on. Um, and uh, he came to change his mind about that. Um, but it's, but uh, although the term is theoretically ambiguous, it's not, there's no, um, there's no risk of, of mistaking what he's talking about because he's very clear. He changes some of the words in, in um, uh, new editions of his uh, doctoral dissertation. Um, but as soon as he discovers the will, uh, he's like, well, that thing in itself, in the Kantian sense, and so um, uh, that's transcendent metaphysics right there. And so when I say metaphysics, I mean transcendent metaphysics in uh, exactly the sense that Kant rejects. And that's, I mean, that's Chopin. That's what he wants. He wants to piss people off. And that's what he wanted. He's like, that thing that you said I couldn't have, I got it. But, right here. but the, the will acquiring itself is not something that can be known um, in by philosophers, is it? It's, uh, it, 
<laughs> well, kind of, uh, Schopenhauer thinks you can. Is that so? Does Schopenhauer straightforwardly, you know, claim that he knows um, uh, the world qua will? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yep, yep, he does. It's pretty straightforward. There's some ambiguity. I think he feels some um, he feels some epistemic anxiety. I think uh, you know, in part from his kind of intellectual closeness to Kant, uh, but also I think he's got a kind of adolescent joy in breaking the uh, you know his his father's rules as well. Um, uh, so there is some ambiguity in his uh, in his terminology. Um, so sometimes he, he doesn't talk about uh, knowledge. Of course, he makes a big distinction. I'm drawn from Kant, but, but generalized between um, conceptual cognition and intuitive cognition. And um, um, I know in the Maimon group, we had a huge discussion about whether, uh, basically about whether intuitive cognition was possible. Um, but uh, Schopenhauer definitely thinks it's possible. You can have intuitions without concepts. You're fine, no worries. Um, and um, and it's that. So it's not. You can't. You can't have direct conceptual cognition of that thing. But you only have intuitive cognition. And then he has a whole series of, you know, somewhat unconvincing but somewhat convincing uh, arguments. You know, it's. Um, Cognition of the will, intuition of the will is derived from inner sense, uh, which is maybe less, has fewer uh, transcendental forms attached to it because it's not causal and it's not spatial, uh, it's only temporal. Uh, and so we kind of know what it is to remove transcendental conditions and get closer to the thing in itself. Um, Yeah, it's a long, <laughs> it's a long story. I have to say personally, um, I just really like the response, um, uh, you know, that, yeah, we could just go ahead and do it. Let's just go ahead and do that metaphysics and see what happens. And, you know, I the mean, fact that daddy can't tells us we're not supposed to, let him come and spank me. Okay, so I, I, mean, I, 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 I just like that app. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, just in this context of, did Schopenhauer claim to know the thing in itself? I was thinking what you think, Alistair and others, um, about the claims. I, I find persuasive the arguments of some scholars like Moira Nichols and Julian Young who claim that 1817, w, uh, you know, volume one, Role is Will and Representation, Schopenhauer pretty straightforwardly equates the will with, with the thing in itself. But that in later work, in volume two of WWR, and especially in later, like very late letters, Schopenhauer qualifies his claim and starts saying things like, well, the will is the thing in itself in appearance, or it's the relative thing in itself, but the real thing in itself, the deeper, the ultimate thing in itself is unknowable. So we go back to something like Karen's, I mean, he comes closer to Kant, except with a mystical, it's like a mystical Kantianism where he says, but mystics realize the ultimate nature of the thing in itself, which is not will. Sometimes he even suggests it's the opposite of will. Will is the root of all suffering, it's terrible, and this thing that mystics realize, well, lo and behold, they're all, you know, blissed out when they have that. Why would they be so happy if they're realizing, you know, the nightmarish nature of the will? That's not what they're doing. They're, they're penetrating more deeply through the will into something salvific, right? I mean, I just, I mean, do you buy that at all? I, I find it persuasive that he's actually moving away from the equation of will with thing in itself later in his life. Yeah, I, I, uh, uh, Swami, you're totally, uh, text, textually, that's totally correct. Um, uh, so the, there's, a, there's uh, what's, what's called a, a hermeneutic uh, interpretation. I think it's maybe Julian Young that says that, I forget. A hermeneutic interpretation of the notion of, of thing in itself. Um, so it's, like you say, it's relational. It's the thing in itself in relation to us and not the thing in itself as it were in itself. Um, and, uh, and then it, he kind of reverts to a kind of, um, you know, it kind of looks like in a way, a kind of late medieval, like let, how does the whole thing hang together, right? The universe has a meaning, 
how can we piece that together? It looks like a, an exercise, kind of uh, a hermeneutic uh, exercise. Um, and then, yeah, the, the second thing you point out about his account of mysticism, that has, um, uh, yeah, the, the, if, the, if, the, if will was the thing in itself too cool, if that was the end of it, then it's difficult to explain uh, what Schopenhauer says of mystics, which is that it's an ecstatic state. Um, and so uh, I think there's a wide consensus in the literature that he must be, certainly by the late work, by second volume of Wells and Representation, he must be committed to the idea that the thing, is, thing in itself is not exhausted by will. There's something else going on in too. So there's really, there's really two things, right? One, so Julian Young and the kind of post-positivist guys, they like that hermeneutic view uh, because it's not metaphysically expensive, right? If you're a kind of broadly in the most broad and general sense, kind of verificationist or, or positivist orientation, which is still present in, uh, in a, a certain amount of um, analytic philosophy, then that's a more attractive view. Um, of course, that's contradicted by the, the, the mystical interpreter. Right? That's an even more fantastic and outlandish view. Right? Not only do we make cognitive contact with the thing in itself, there's another thing in itself right behind that thing in itself so in a way that's even more outlandish so it's weird that there are these two things going on um at once but you're definitely true uh, it's definitely true what you say that they that they both are um uh i i personally like the early stuff i'm like that's more right you made a good muscular claim schopenhauer let's work with it um and you know later when philosophers get older and they're just you know, move more to the center. I'm just like, no, that's not so interesting. So I'm just, I'm personally not so taken by that, uh, by the hermeneutic view. And I just want to, I did publish. I thought it was a, uh, I really liked it, a little paper, or it's a part of a paper uh, in which I argue that the hermeneutic view is self-defeating because Schopenhauer has a direct realist theory of hermeneutical interpretation. So when I see a word. I, 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 am, I am direct, I make, I make direct contact. I don't, I don't pause the word and then wonder what it means. I make direct contact with the meaning uh, behind the word. And so even if his hermeneutic view is correct, I still make direct cognitive contact with the thing in itself. So I thought that was a nice, a real stick in the eye for them. So the hermeneutic interpretation is just consistent with the original metaphysical interpretation. I'm sorry, I see there's a, a question. Okay, yeah, so we have a question from Faye. Hi, thank you. Um, so I think one quite attractive feature of Schopenhauer's moral thought is uh, that he includes animals within his world and he often writes about them and seems to give compassion to them. Um, I think there's a supplement to the world as well in representation where he even uh, discusses insects and snails and these just very tiny creatures that usually we pay no attention to. So I was wondering how uh, taking these uh, factors into consideration, um, how it could inform our understanding of Schopenhauerian compassion. Um, and as a side note, it seems like these considerations about animals would undermine the usual kind of psychological approaches because it's kind of hard to articulate how exactly we are able to identify with, for example, an insect. Um, and Schopenhauer just seems to take that for granted. So yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, hey, that's a super point. I'm going to write that one down. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I haven't, I know uh, other people, Sandra Shapsha in particular, are super interested uh, in the, um, the, the, the question of animal, um, the status of animals in Schopenhauer and how kind of progressive he seems uh, on, that, on that issue. Um, and of course, he, he himself, that's, a, that's one of those cases where he very definitely says, you know, the Western tradition has sucked on this. And, you know, we need to go uh, to South Asian tradition, um, you know, to see just how terrible historically our treatment of and attitude towards animals has, has been. Um, and I, so I haven't really thought about it, but that's a great point that it undermines the psychological theory uh, because our ability, right, we, we clearly do experience compassion with uh with animals we clearly um we know very clearly what their um emotions are uh we respond to them we don't always exercise compassion with animals but we don't always exercise compassion with human beings either um uh but so so it's very clear 
how um, how it's consistent with his his view that compassion would extend kind of um, uh, down the great chain of being to speak um, in a uh, 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 chronologically inappropriate way. Um, and yeah, it makes a psychological theory of um, of, of identification very impossible uh, because right, what's we're going to have much more trouble thinking our way into the mind of a praying mantis uh, or whatnot. Um, and uh, it makes, uh, conversely, it makes, so it's decent for my view, because I, you know, I think you can look into the eyes of your cat and you can definitely, you can tell whether your cat is angry or not. Um, but it's also, uh, it, uh, it's also, I think Swami's uh, view would, would work there, right? If metaphysical, if we're metaphysically identical and um, compassion is the intrusion of that uh, metaphysical identity into a, a, a world of representation where uh, 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 differentiation is stable, and that differentiation has not been threatened, but we somehow got this intrusion of identity into that stable framework, uh, then um, that, that, that's a good explanation for you know, how we could feel compassion for, um, uh, for animals. I, I, do, I do want to say that I'm supervising a fascinating thesis right now. Um, uh, 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 and the, um, the writer of the thesis is thinking exactly about that question that you posed there, right? How can we, in fact, uh, think our way into uh, the minds of, of, um, of animals, of insects, um, and the guy is a panpsychist, so he's like, maybe even rocks. Can we think what it's like? Uh, to be a to be a rock, and it's a, it's kind of a fascinating. He's a biologist and a philosopher, and it's kind of a fascinating uh, strategy. It may not be as difficult uh, as you think, right? The analytic philosophy stuff, the what it's like to be a bat stuff, right? It has a very it 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 wants to emphasize the incommensurability uh, of of uh, of one mental state. Um, you know, of someone else's mental state with my mental state, in order to prove a metaphysical point about dualism, and that's that's fine, good, good argument. Um, but they're not interested in the phenomenological question of, well, you know, well, what kind of access do I have to thinking about other people's uh, mental states? So that we get the false impression from thinking about those thought experiments that it's really hard uh, to think what other people are are feeling. Um, but that's a, an artifact of the motivation for the thought experiment, not of, of doing the attempt. I think it'd be fun uh, to do the attempt. Animal phenomenology. Okay, but maybe not now, Alistair. Oh, I would support it though, <laughs> not, sorry. And not collectively. <laughs> yes, so before you uh, propose that we do this thought experiment collectively, <laughs> maybe I um, uh, jump in and... Um, um, propose that we conclude this uh, formal part of the session. So um, thanks again for a great paper and discussion uh, to both Alistair and also to Swami, of course, for his great comments. Um, so let us uh, thank our speakers. And uh, for those who still um, have questions or want to have a chat, please uh, hang on. Uh, Steve's going to stop the recording probably. And um, so we can have some time and, um, and as said, uh, continue the conversation.